You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, dear listeners, and also human listeners, and welcome to the Common Descent <laughs> Podcast. Episode 35. Woohoo! Because this is an episode that ends in the number five, as we decided 10 episodes ago, every episode that ends in the number five is an extinction related episode. I feel like that deserves a cheer, but that also is a depressing. Hooray! <laughs> ex- extinction. <laughs> ah, my step! The previous three installments in this tradition were all about mass extinctions, including two of the big five mass extinctions times where things got so bad that they wiped out at least half of all life in the universe. I mean, (laughs) on the planet, (laughs) but today we are talking about the opposite indeed of extinction. Today, our subject is de-extinction, the reversal of extinction. We are going to talk in this episode about what the extinction is it mm-hmm. is not just a sci-fi thing it's a real thing people are looking into yes how people are doing it how it might look in the future why people want to do it and toward the end why it's controversial and why there are people who really really don't like the idea yeah it is, this is this is one of those sensitive topics yes it, there, there's a lot of debate it's a, it's very interesting we'll get into all that absolutely this topic was requested during our live stream our first live stream event by josh and kozu so thank you yeah listeners thank you for both for suggestion. the suggestion and for showing up to the first live event yeah that was good stuff yes before we get started a few quick announcements to to blow through hey you know who we love our patrons yeah we do And you know how we reward that love by giving our patrons all sorts of fun, behind-the-scenes, extra goodies. And one of the goodies you can get as a patron of the podcast is that we will shout your name with gratitude on the podcast. Much like you're about to hear. So thank you very much to our newest patron, Renee Bell. Welcome. Welcome, and thank you for patronizing us. Thank you for your patronage. (laughs) Thank you very much. It's awesome. Speaking of Patreon, one of the things that we are able to do with the funds and stuff from Patreon is expand on the podcast, and we do, in fact, have a couple of expansions coming up. Yes. We have been we are currently in the works on two side projects that you can keep an eye out for. One of them is still a few months away, mm-hmm. so you won't hear it anytime soon, but a lot of people on the survey said that they wanted more guests. And this particular project should make those people happy. We are attempting to to address the, that request. The other side project will be coming along much sooner, next month, in fact, because Will and I were looking at the calendar and we realized the incredible coincidence that the number of Saturdays in June is the same as the number of films there will be in the Jurassic Park franchise by the end of June. And when that coinci- kind of coincidence lines up, you can't say no. So stay tuned for all the Saturdays in June. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, I'm so excited. And I'm pretty sure that's all the announcements. I think that's everything important that needs to be said. Not quite. I'm Not pretty quite. sure. No, 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 no. Time for the news. In fact, there's one other big announcement because our fans requested something of us. And we did it. And we finally got the results because we were asked to do the poll a second time. And we did so, and that poll has now come to a close, and we need yes, to announce the results. Tell us what the results were, Will. This is our Snakes versus Crocs poll. Absolutely. We did our Snakes versus Crocs poll a second time so that more people could participate, and this time we did it on Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon, and got results from all three. And the numbers are in, and I would drum roll, but it will rattle my microphone, and I don't want to do that. (laughs) (laughs) For Twitter, we had 54 total votes, 35 crocs, 19 snakes, 65 Mm -hmm. to 35% spread. On Facebook, we had... Nick, by the way, uh, Nick, we added you in on that. 
Yes, yes, we have adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> For Facebook, we had 37 total votes, 21 crocs, 16 snakes, a 57 43 mm-hmm. percent split, and on Patreon, we had five votes, two crocs, three snakes. So, victory on Patreon for you, sir. Yes. But on the other two, <laughs> Crocs <laughs> reign supreme. We decided to total it up, which is not statistically very significant, but it's nice to have one set of numbers to work with. Total, we had 96 votes for this, so thank you all for participating. This was a lot of fun. It ended up yes. being 58 Crocs, 38 Snakes, so about a 60-40 split, which... Not too far off. That's that's, that's pretty reasonable for for snakes. That's not bad. I think (laughs) that the results of this poll are a wonderful demonstration of why science does not operate by democracy. (laughs) This is why we don't vote on truth. (laughs) Also, I would like to point out that while the Twitter and, and Patreon polls are anonymous... Facebook tells you who voted for what, so I know who you are, listeners. I also know who you are, and there's more of you that are on my side, so we we will. (laughs) (laughs) In all seriousness, this this was a whole lot of fun. It was super exciting that people asked for it again, and we were very, very excited to see so many people get so engaged and excited about it. We had some fun discussions with people trying to figure out which way to vote, so... (laughs) There was also a lot of vouching for other groups. Primates got a shout out again because we can't get rid of them. <laughs> and also there was some very impassioned support for turtles. Yeah, they even made their own poll to try to, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> try to counter. They, they accused us of false dichotomy, which I appreciated. <laughs> we, we will certainly, we are happy to award turtles the honorary title of third best yes absolutely (laughs) (laughs) so thank you for indulging our silly little game absolutely it was a lot of fun tune in next time for for i assume around three somewhere in the future (laughs) around three that it'll it'll actually you you can vote in the primaries this year (laughs) we're gonna sneak them onto the ballot so anyway (laughs) before we get to our main topic every episode will and i like to bring to the podcast a couple of pieces of news from the world of paleontology and life history that have caught our attention. Will! Yes? I will kick things off. I think I will start... In in honor of the poll results, I'll go ahead and start with my uh, obligatory croc news uh, Mm -hmm. that I I have... I've almost managed to have one for each of the most recent episodes. I'm very proud of this. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's very stagnant and boring. Yes, yeah, it's awesome and fascinating. This one <laughs> is very cool. This is a previously discovered crocodiliform that has been finally identified and shows some very interesting traits. Uh, it shows traits of both terrestrial and marine crocs, which means it could be potentially a transitional stage to a marine lifestyle. Cool. Which is awesome. Now, this is research done by Attila Osi in Pure J, and the article I was reading is uh, in The Independent uh, by Josh Gavatis. The Basically, to give you the, the background, is in the Budapest Museum collections, there is a, a crocodiliform fossil specimen that originally was discovered in 1996 uh, in Hungary. So it's been on the shelf for a while now but it was researched and given a name recently the name is pause for pronunciation magyarosuchus phytosil this this specimen is a decently complete it's got portions of the jaw and a number of postcranial or body elements including vertebrae that include the very last not every single one but goes down to the last tail vertebrae. So, I mean, they've, they've got a good spread of the skeleton. Very nice. Estimated total length is just above four and a half meters. It's like 4.6 to 4.8. So you're looking at a, around a 14-foot croc relative. And Not too bad. Would have been living during the late portion of the early Jurassic. So in that early section, it was right before you got to the mid-Jurassic. 
this is when you see the rise of a lot of those uh, uh, old croc groups. Uh, specifically, one in particular that will become big here is the Thalatosuchians that start to really arise in the early Jurassic and diversify. Now, yes, marine. Yes, and we'll rocks. get we'll get into more details. We've already gone over them in our our episode two, uh, the episode about the winners of the poll. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but we'll we'll revisit them very briefly. Uh, but the reason we get into this is when they analyzed the skeleton, they found interesting features, specifically in the tail. They found spines on the vertebrae that show hints and signs that there was at least the beginning of a fluted tail or a a finned tail yeah, like a shark like a the, shark the projections up absolutely and down. this one would be called a hypo uh circle tail which is when the two lobes of the fin the bottom one is bigger because on crocs yes. when they did their fin they put a fin on top and then the bottom the end of the tail just kind of juked downward and became like huh. an upside down shark tail it's really interesting stuff you can see it in the spines of a lot of these marine crocs it's just permanently curved down and then had spines that went up to create the top of the tail which is cool uh, yeah it's it's literally the opposite of the way fish do it so it's very interesting <laughs> now this is not a, a weird feature for this group of crocs but it also has osteoderm armor which is normal among crocs but the marine crocs mostly lack it or certain groups of them do so this has shared features and to give you a, a background into the family when they placed when they did a, a taxonomic study they found that it grouped right at the base of thylaticosuchians specifically the metrio rhynchoids these along with the teleosaurs which form the two main groups of the thylaticosuchians are two different marine crocs crocodile forms early but still pretty close to our they're, they're still in the main branch of our uh that also includes what led to the modern grouping so this isn't going back too too far in their ancestry teleosaurs kind of resembled gharials long thin snouts normal arms and legs but salt glands and found in marine sediment so they were living in ocean habitats and uh, but still were able to come on land. So still able to crawl uh, ashore and feasibly walk pretty well. The metriorhynchids are the extreme group. They have turned their front limbs, their forelimbs, into paddles. They still have kind of footed back legs, but they're much more marine adapted. They have the fluted, finned tail, and they have lost all of their body armor for a, a much more aquatic and very dolphin-like anatomy. Very much more sleek-bodied. Yeah, yeah. Lightweight. You don't have all that yes. encumbrance. And so they are fully, fully aquatic. Uh, because they're so aquatic, there's even been question as to whether they still laid eggs or not. Because scientists are Ooh. unsure whether they'd be able to come ashore. So that's They haven't found evidence of live birth, but... They, they're weird enough that it would make sense if they did. So that's something that cool. is looked into. But they are at the base of these these flippered crocs. And because it possesses both the beginning of the fluted tail and the body armor and still has normal limbs for, as far as crocs go, it's believed that this may be the transitional form to that more derived marine you know, lineage, that this is the start of that path. Yeah, before they had lost the armor, but exactly. they had already started developing those aquatic adaptations. Yes. And this is this is compounded by the fact that one, it was found with cephalopod fossils, and unlike most early uh, Thalatosuchians at this time, it was found in pelagic deposit versus coastal lagoon or estuarian. Uh, Basically, pelagic being open water. Yes, it was found in open ocean, not along the shore or in river inlets it was found out in open water so this was a Neat. true already a very marine croc that was still featuring very much your your classic uh you know crocodilian and crocodiliform features very interesting yeah. find 
It it also was big. It was the largest non metriorinkid metriorinkoid to date. So there's a specific group within the metriorinkoids that are the metriorinkids. It's not yes. in there, but <laughs> it's big for the over for the overall group. One of the interesting discussions that comes up whenever you have the development of a specific lifestyle is the question of what order things happened in. Absolutely. And I like that this is one of those where we know they lost their armor, we know they gained aquatic adaptations, and here's a little hint of what order those events occurred in along that lineage. Yes. Which is pretty cool. It's it's interesting when you have, especially when it's like a suite of characters, where it's three things had to happen to be either gained or lost and the order can sometimes you know we found instances where it's been extremely surprising what developed first that what i always think of in this example is like turtles where we found out that the plastron yep. came before the carapace which is the opposite of almost every other armored animal where the back... <laughs> yeah the bottom armor might have evolved before the top armor and that's bizarre <laughs> turtles but yeah oh yeah turtles are very weird <laughs> but it's it's neat and the 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 fossils themselves like the the paper is a really, really good one. Indeed. But hey, you know what's cooler than aquatic crocs? Uh, not mathematically speaking, but... Aquatic snakes. <laughs> Two out of five listeners agree <laughs> that aquatic snakes. So this is a study that has discovered new fossil material of from what I have come to think of as the age of giant sea snakes, even though that's not 100%, but you'll see. <laughs> this is research that ha comes from Jacob McCartney et al. in Acta Paleontologica Polonica. Jacob, incidentally, is another Penn State grad. He graduated the year before I started. Cool. Went on to do snakes. Cool dude, because he does snakes. <laughs> Back in the episode three, the snakes episode, we talked about how during the Paleogene, there were some really fancy sea snakes yes. at the time. For the purposes of this study, notably, there were two families of snakes that have not only uh, shapes to their vertebrae and ribs that look like they were adapted for aquatic living, but also that are usually found in either near shore or marine environments. These are the Paleophids and the Nigerophids. This new material is... Fossil remains of one of each of those families among the largest of each of those families. Nice. This material comes from Mali, which was at the time part of the Trans-Sahara Seaway, which was in a shallow sea that stretched off the Tethys Ocean and went through West Africa. There are remains of three snakes in this description. So this is very classic, straightforward paleontology. We found some new material. What does it tell us about these new th these creatures that we didn't know before? The first, and the most exciting if you're into really big creatures, is new fossil material of a species called Paleophis coliseus, among the largest snakes that ever lived, and the largest sea snake in history. This material comes from the Eocene. It is mostly, entirely, lots of new vertebrae from all up and down the vertebral column. The exciting thing about having lots of new vertebrae means that we can get a better sense of how the bones shifted over the course of the body, which when you have an animal that is almost entirely composed of vertebrae, <laughs> it's very helpful to be able to say, okay, how did, where are we on the vertebral column? How do the, what do the front ones look like compared to the back vertebrae? It's like trying to find an evolutionary series, but just within a back, like <laughs> just within a single animal. Yes. So if you have big gaps, it's really, really hard to put them in order. <laughs> Jacob et al. were also able to come up with some new size estimates. More on that in a moment. The next species of snake they found in their collection was a new species from a slightly earlier deposit in the Paleocene. This is a Nigerophid snake, the other group of sea snakes at the time, known from a single vertebra. In this in this study, that is undoubtedly different from other Nigerophid snakes, partially due to its size. This is a species that has been named Amananulam sanogoi, and it is, and we'll do this one in a second, the size, perhaps tied for the largest Nigerophid. Woo! And there is a third snake that they found, another single vertebra that 
doesn't fit either of those two can't quite be assigned to a family. <laughs> There's not enough of it. They don't know enough about it yet. They just, we have a vertebra. It's definitely a snake, but they don't know what it is yet. Came from the same locality as the Paleophis, the first one. And it also interesting for its size. So here are the size estimates. <laughs> um, the size estimates are difficult to do for snakes because you're, you don't, like, like I said, it's hard to know how the vertebra shift over the course of the body. And without knowing that, it's very difficult to know, can you estimate length based on just a couple of vertebrae? So these estimates are based on modern snakes, which is hopefully close, but might not, might not be exact. Paleophis, depending on what measurement you use, their estimate comes in at between 8 and 12 meters. Wow. Which is, our fellow Americans, between 25 and 40 feet. Wow. Which makes it, and we already knew this about Paleophis, the second or third largest snake of all time. Jeez. A sea snake. The second snake, Abenanulum, the new species, comes out to an estimated two meters, so six or seven feet, which is roughly the same size as the largest sea snakes today, and twice the size of almost every other Nigerophiid. Almost every other snake in this family of sea snakes is half the size of this one. The third snake, the one that they're not exactly sure what the identity is, came out to an estimate 5.4 meters or 18 feet, which is really exciting because we don't know what it is. <laughs> All we know is that it is a giant unidentified snake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these estimates is interesting because there's two things of note. One is that these are the measurements assume the vertebrae they're using are the largest vertebra in the body, which is probably not true, statistically speaking. So these are probably underestimates, at least by a little bit. <laughs> and then the other thing that they mentioned in the study is the same thing that was discussed when Titanoboa was discovered, more on that back in episode three, is that large reptiles typically suggest high temperatures. Yes. You need high temperatures to fuel a large body. In this case, that fits perfectly with previous interpretations of the Paleocene and Eocene having very warm tropics. And indeed, the other two largest snakes of all time also come from the Paleocene and Eocene, Titanoboa and Gigantophis. Nice. So this was a time, this is a few new bits of snake information to paint a better picture of the time of the giant snakes. We, what, this, what this little fossil <coughs> collection really represents is the, the very final meeting of the giant sea snake club. Yes, <laughs> this is the final meeting of the convention. Yes, because it's like... They ran out of funding. They're just all there next to each other. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's very cool. It's the knowledge that there were truly impressively sized snakes is impressive in and of itself. But the idea that there were almost equal to the size of these large snakes that, you know, like Titanobo who are so famous, but in the ocean as well is really yes. what's fascinating to me. Cause we don't see that kind of size comparison in modern sea snakes at all they don't reach no, modern sea snakes are maybe like nine feet mm -hmm. the biggest biggest ones yeah so they're they're which is is a decent size for a snake but that's fairly moderate as far as snakes go like there's yeah certainly not huge there's tons of snakes that reach above that that don't even get to the truly maximum you know like almost 20 foot sizes mm -hmm. so the fact that there was a another snake reaching almost titanoboa sizes but in the ocean is what's really interesting to me is, is was it doing something different or was there something different about the ocean as to why you got such big marine snakes? And that's cool. Yes. Time will tell. Yes. Awesome. So speaking of aquatic stuff and marine stuff, still my next one's about a whale. We did go almost completely aquatic. This yeah. section. Yeah. Well, there you go. Whale. Whales. <sighs> This bit Here's of research. the whale. It never, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> this bit of research is on an early ancestor to modern filter feeding whales, a previously known species, but research done on a skull to look at the feeding mechanism and the potential uh, origins of filter feeding. And this whale raises new evidence onto exact or about how filter feeling and baleen the hair like stuff they used to filter feed came about or at least what order things might have happened so this research is done by r 
Ewan Fordyce and Felix G. Marks in Current Biology. And this is a Gizmodo article written by George Dvorsky. The, to, to really start this one off, first we have to go over the, the, not controversy, but the debate about baleen and the mystery behind its origin. So baleen is made of the same material as our hair and fingernails. It's this keratinous structure inside the mouths of modern whales. All the big whales you typically think about, blue whales, right whales, you know, uh, uh, humpback whales, all have these big hair bristles that hang down from the top jaw that act like a comb to filter out these small animals that they engulf with their, their giant mouths and throats and then filter out as they push the seawater out through them. The issue, as you may have already realized, is that hair does not fossilize. So we don't have a fossil record for baleen itself, really, which means we don't really know how it evolved. When did baleen first present itself in whales? When did it first start to show up? Right, because before that, they would have been toothed. They were like toothed whales. Normal animals. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, to and they're still toothed whales today. These are your dolphins and your orca and your belugas and so, so they have you know they have not all gotten rid of teeth. The sperm whales, the big one that mm -hmm. still has teeth. But they all were toothed. They came from toothed ancestors. But somewhere along the line, a branch, the Mississippi whales, got rid of their teeth and replaced it with baleen. At what point this happened is still debated and the order of which it happened. Like, how did they transition? What happened to move to that new feeding style is really where a lot of the discussion and potential debate is. A common hypothesis, and one of the ones that has a lot of traction among whale researchers, is that the toothed whales eventually started filter feeding through their teeth. And this is a practice we see in animals today, specifically crab eater seals are the go-to example. They have these teeth that have multiple points, and on the crab eater, they've actually curved into these like, like little hooks that form these little holes through the tooth and the teeth fit together to make a sieve for them to catch krill with. Yeah, they're pretty cool. They're real, and they're so weird. It, it's like someone sculpted them. It's really, <laughs> really weird. So the idea is that tooth whales, who had very similar multi-cust, multi-pointed teeth, at some point started filtering with those teeth, and then at some point further down, baleen started to be added in with the teeth to help better catch the stuff. Right. To just add another layer of filter and then at some point the teeth were no longer needed because the baling was doing a good enough job and transitioned fully to baling mm -hmm. that's kind of the the gist of what a, a lot of scientists think might have happened and there are whales that have shown evidence of toothed filter feeding this whale suggests that that's not how it went so lanocetus denticrinatus was a a large early whale from the late Eocene, so this is about 34 million years ago, and we see the first uh, 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 of the filter feeding lineage about 35 million years ago, so this is before that. Uh, big whale, about 26 feet long, so a good size specimen, which is big for early whales. This is a, yeah. unusually large. This is not as big as they get today, but this is getting up toward the size of modern orcas, so yeah. This is a, not a as big, not as big as some sea snakes. <laughs> it's not a competition anymore. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's always a competition until I win. <laughs> it's also uh, the second oldest ancestor to the baleen whales yet discovered. So Ooh. it's it's getting back toward their origins, and this would make it a, a you know uh, a great representative to look at that baleen. So they looked in the mouth and looked for signs of baleen growth or, or features that they might see. And basically, this is a toothed whale. And what they found was that it had very sharp teeth that had been dulled from eating large prey. And the signs of the blood vesicles on the roof of the mouth pointed to well-developed gums, but not baleen growth. Interesting. So this was a big toothy whale with healthy gums to make healthy teeth to eat big food. They didn't find any suggestions of filter feeding, and they didn't find any suggestions of baleen. 
So what this led them to suggest is a new, a different route for baleen origination in that there was a different phase between the tooth and the baleen. Instead of it being a tooth baleen hybrid, it was a toothless state. They believe the teeth had to go first before baleen came in. Interesting. So they would have been like walruses. Yes, exactly. And they suggest a suction feeding. And there have been cool. a- ancient uh, uh, dolphin relatives that seem to have a suction feeding skull. And basically, they suggest that they would have lost their teeth to start suction feeding animals off the seafloor, much like walrus. And then that suction eventually w- would add baling to help trap the things they sucked up to act just kind of as a, as a gate and then would turn into filter feeding there's where there are people on both sides who acknowledge this as being good research and think it suggests a good solution and there are others who think it goes against some previous findings and that there's still more to be said about the tooth filter feeding so this is this is a very young and 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 is needs more discussion to go with it but it's kind of turns the other hypothesis on its head if it is correct. So it's interesting. I like things like this because whale the evolution of whales is one of those things that we know a ton about. Like yes. we know a, we have a whole lot about the evolution of whales. And the more we learn, it just means the more specific things we can argue yes. about. <laughs> like how did they, how did it go from being on land to being in the water? It's like, all right, well, well we have a really good idea that, oh, well, how about mm-hmm. baleen? And we can just yep. constantly zoom in closer and closer to figure out what what aspects of this transition we can learn. That's that's the fascinating and this really goes for science in general, but that's one of the fascinating things about research to me, and I think it's also where a lot of confusion and headaches for some people come from science. And it's like, <laughs> we've been looking at the stars since before we had electricity, you know, how do we still have these big questions? And it's like, well, we've answered a lot of the questions that were asked. Yeah. But we can just keep zooming in. But from the outside, it sounds like we're constantly just like. <laughs> Never deciding where? on anything. <laughs> yes. Where are all these questions coming from? How do you. Didn't you, you solve know? whales? Let's figure it out. The other interesting thing this whale shows is that it was commonly thought that the baleen filter feeding was what allowed modern whales to get so big and that Hmm. that's why early whales were smaller but the size of this whale suggests that whales were getting big before baleen so it it also kind of upsets a not a not a long held but a a concept that had kind of stood and so this this is this whale's upset and everything (laughs) it's another (laughs) one of those what came first questions and what order did things happen very exactly. neat. Very neat. My next bit of news is not about aquatic things at all. In Aww. fact, this is this is a little bit cheating because my next bit of news is two studies that happen to have done pretty much uh, very similar things. This, this is unfair. These are... I'm going to go look up one right now. <laughs> <laughs> These are the reports of the oldest record, by far the oldest record, of viruses in humans, specifically hepatitis B. Fun. Two reports, two studies, the first by Barbara Mulliman et al. in Nature, and the second by Ben Krauss Kiora et al. in BioArchive, both reported upon in the New York Times by Carl Zimmer, the eminent and wonderful Carl Zimmer. <laughs> two of the teams examined human remains to see if they could find signs of viral DNA within the human DNA. So the way that viruses work is that viruses infect the dna of your cells with their own viral dna which gets the cell to produce more viruses which reprograms your cell to make more of what invaded it it is absolutely the plot of many sci-fi movies <laughs> yes it is viruses are terrifying <laughs> they are so weird up until now the oldest viral dna ever found in human remains was 450 years old from a, a human mummy in italy And there have been a few others similar to that uh, age. Knowing the history of viruses is really important, particularly things like Hep B, which kills hundreds of thousands of people a year. Yes. The first team found, looked at a bunch, a bunch, a lot, lots of different human remains, 
and found 12 cases of ancient hep B viruses in human DNA, ranging from several hundred to a few thousand years old. The second team found three cases of hep B in human remains the, at, at three different ages, 1,000 years, 5,300 years old, and oh. 7,000 years old. Wow, that stepped up fast. So the, fir- the really exciting part of this is we have extended the, his, the record of, of human viruses <laughs> by 15 times, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty insane. Wow. In the article, Johannes Krauss, one of the folks who worked on the second group, observed that it was really interesting how much of this viral DNA was found in the, the teeth of the people they studied and suggested that these must have been very late stage infections and might even have contributed to the death of these people. Oh, wow. These were, in, these were serious cases. Yes. Altogether, these remains show that hepatitis B was quite prevalent in humans going back several thousand years at least. Also, the strains they're finding include strains that are different from what we see today and more closely related to hepatitis strains we see today in chimps and gorillas. Oh. This is a virus that has diversified with apes, and these earlier strains hadn't quite developed as to be as distinct as what we see in humans today. That's cool. In the future, uh, people want to look for more hepatitis B in human remains, including there's a, a group that is now looking for hepatitis B in Neanderthals to get us even more information about how this virus has evolved over time. Obviously, understanding the history of a virus is wonderfully important for protecting us from the virus today. Must know your enemy. Yes. And this brings me to the final point I want to make about this and the reason that I knew I had to talk about this one for today's episode. One of the ways you study viruses (laughs) that you've pulled out of ancient DNA, that part of the first team has done this, is by transferring the viral DNA into human cells in a lab, which then produce extinct strains of hepatitis B. (laughs) Yep. Somewhere in the world, perhaps right at this very moment, these scientists have created strains of hepatitis B from several thousand years ago. Yes. Which is super cool. Also the plot of oh. a of a sci-fi movie. <laughs> Absolutely it is. Absolutely. So keep your fingers crossed, everybody. Yep. But that's the fact that we can pull that off is incredible. Like, that's very sci-fi in and of itself. Like just describing that we can do that sounds complete i mean at not too long ago would have been completely out of the realm of possibility yes and so that's it's very impressive and it's it's a exciting discovery as you mentioned knowing the virus means there's more potential for us to figure out a way to you know better handle it or potentially cure it and man what what better way than to increase your knowledge of it by a few thousand years. Yes. Now, I should make the point, and we'll talk about more of this here very, very soon, resurrecting an ancient virus is a whole lot more straightforward than resurrecting other ancient things, because a virus, the whole thing that a virus does is that it spreads purely by genetic information. Yes. A virus is a, is a capsule of proteins that carries genetic information around, puts it in a cell, and the cell grows the virus. So being able to... It's not actually all that surprising. As long as we can get a complete virus genetic sequence, absolutely, all we have to do is the same thing a virus does. Put it in a cell, and it grows the virus. That's what it's made to do, is copy itself. It gets a bit more complicated when you try Mm -hmm. to de-extinct other things. Which brings us to the main topic for today's episode, the real-life science of de-extinction. Before we dive in to the science of de-extinction, I want to tell everybody a story. A story of a goat named Celia. Celia was a bucardo, a Pyrenean ibex. This is a subspecies of wild goat formerly endemic to the Iberian Peninsula. That's where Spain and Portugal are. 
In 1999, Celia was very special to Cardo because she was what is called an endling, the last one. Sad term for a sad thing. The Bicardo was driven to extinction, as so many animals are, by humans, or at least near extinction. And then, in January 2000, Celia was crushed by a tree, and her subspecies was extinct. Aww. However, the scientists studying Celia had had the thought to preserve some of her cells, froze them to keep them viable. After Celia disappeared, they had the crazy thought to try something called somatic cell nuclear transfer. The way this works is you take the genetic information from the nucleus out of one of Celia's body cells, inject it into the emptied egg cell of a goat, put that egg cell into a mama goat, and see if it will develop into an embryo. This is the same procedure that gave us Dolly the sheep. Yeah. And this is how you clone mammals. This had been done before, obviously, but it had never been done with a frozen cell from an extinct organism. They implanted 57 of these eggs into surrogate goat mothers. 50 of them failed to lead to pregnancies. Six of the ones that did lead to pregnancies ended in miscarriage. The last one, on June 30th, 2003, via C-section, gave birth to a baby Bucardo. Three and a half years after the animal had gone extinct. Ten minutes later... Celia's baby clone died because, at least in part, she had been born with severely malformed lungs. Ah. Uh. For ten minutes, for the first time in history, an extinct animal lived on the planet. Yes. So let's talk about what de-extinction is. De-extinction is exactly that. De-extinction is this sub the idea of bringing organisms back from extinction. Unextincting them. Unextincting them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time you will hear de-extinction referred to in regards to local extinction or, or limited extinction so for example yeah. you wolves in yellowstone yeah, a regional yes. loss of an animal wolves were extinct in the region we brought in wolves from somewhere else condors Brown. were extinct if in the wild condors condors are on the brink of extinction <laughs> condors were extinct <laughs> in the wild and we put them back from breeding programs yes uh, this, th those are a type of de-extinction. Yeah, we, we talk about brown pelicans here in Tampa all the time. Yep. Same thing happened with them. But that's not what we're talking about in this episode. No. In this episode, we are talking about bringing back entirely vanished groups of organisms. Groups that don't have a convenient representative still around somewhere else in the world that we can replace them with. Truly extinct. Which raises two very important questions. The first is... Can you even do that? And the second is, why would you want to? The first question is a, a little bit philosophical, if, if we may get philosophical for a moment. <laughs> Can you really bring back an extinct species or subspecies or lineage? If Celia II, because that's how you name clones, mm -hmm. had grown up, if you had managed to raise a population of these, would that have been been a true return to what you had before yes what do you lose in extinction would a group of bucardos born to domestic goats raised by humans and put back into an environment that had rejected them years earlier be a good representation of bucardos i remember having a conversation with a friend of mine once talking about de-extinction you know the mammoth things like that uh, and he, I was expressing skepticism, and he said, but wouldn't you want to do it just to study them? Like, what was a mammoth like? What was a mm -hmm. saber-toothed cat like yeah. or something? And I said, I, but you, would you know that if you brought a mammoth back from extinction and they were eating rocks? <laughs> like, yes. is, is that what mammoths do? I don't know. I don't have a mammoth to compare it to. Exactly. Is it developing the same way? Is it acting the same way? Does it have food to, you know... Are you going to get something that is really the same as the thing that you lost? Yes. It's it's that it's that classic cloning, you know, dilemma that movies love to use and anytime clones come up in shows and comic books is the if someone were to clone you, is that clone you or someone else? Yes. And this is basically the same question but in reverse. If you were to clone someone who passed away, did you bring that person back or not? 
And I would add to this, in the subject of de-extinction, if aliens were to clone and raise a human yes. on a planet with no humans, would that person end up being a reasonable representation of humanity? Now, in some cases, yeah, absolutely, right? Certain features, you put, it's a genetic thing, you see how the physiology develops, you see what proteins yes. we're presenting. But I, I would argue, and I think that it's difficult to argue against this, that you can't get an exact replica of what has been lost. Uh, I will quote Ben Novak, who I spoke to several months ago about this very subject, and we'll bring Ben up later in this podcast again. He said, when we were talking about this, there is always something lost in extinction. Absolutely. Which brings us to the next question. If you can't get an exact replica of what was lost, why even do it? Now, there are a handful of answers to this question. Uh, in one, uh, Like we said, there are certain things you could certainly learn. There is also the argument that is oh so popular in the movies that we do it because we can, because yes. it's cool, because we want to create a biological preserve, a living how biological attraction. How can you stand on the brink of discovery? <laughs> and not act. <laughs> I'm so glad we both recently rewatched the movie. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> But that kind of argument doesn't get a whole lot of funding or support from the public, necessarily. The big argument, the big, the sort of, sort of the big justification that you, you will hear most often for de-extinction is to use it as a type of ecosystem engineering. Revive and Restore is an organization that pulls together people from around the world and funding from, from various sources to work on subjects uh, of what they call genetic rescue. This is one of the things that they are involved in. And on their website, they define the extinction as the restoration of ecological function of extinct species. Episode eight. If you think back to episode eight, where we ended the episode by promising to talk about this subject, which we also did last episode. So, hey, we did it. Yes. Back in episode eight, conservation paleontology, we talked about the notion that when animals leave an ecosystem when a species disappears from an ecosystem it leaves it incomplete that there are ecosystems today that have lower diversity that seeds don't disperse the way they used to and nutrients don't disperse the way they used to the the the, the shape of the landscape has changed because the big animals that used to govern that ecosystem are no longer there we talked about Sergei Zimov's wonderful Pleistocene Park project in Siberia, <laughs> where those experiments have shown that putting animals, big grazers, back into the tundra can turn them back into grasslands. More productive, more diverse grasslands. They can even control how much greenhouse gases the permafrost is holding onto in the soil, which affects the climate. The, these animals and plants transform ecosystems. And when you lose one, especially a very important one, you end up with an ecosystem that is impoverished, an ecosystem that is less healthy. And we live in a world today full of unhealthy ecosystems. Absolutely. So the argument, the big argument for de-extinction is, what if we could bring things back? Not necessarily the exact same thing. We don't necessarily need a Bucardo but something that will do the same thing a Bacardo did. Something that will fit that same niche and help maintain the ecosystem the way that it was back before someone came along and screwed it up. Whoever that was. It's, it's that rewilding yes. of these ecosystems. Reintroduction of the wolves in Yellowstone, which yep. anyone who... Go look it up. The... YouTube video of wolves being put back in Yellowstone and the trophic cascade of how it affected the whole ecosystem yep. is one of the coolest videos out there. <laughs> the only difference is that when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, they didn't have to create wolves. Yeah. <laughs> Which brings us to de-extinction. There are three general methods that are, that are talked about as, as avenues for de-extinction. Cloning, genetic engineering, more on that in a bit, and backbreeding. Now let's start with cloning. And the reason we'll start with cloning is because I already talked a little bit about it with Bacardo, and because the last two episodes that I mentioned this subject in, I ended by saying, I will tell you if you can use DNA to bring back extinct species, and now I'm finally doing it. <laughs> yes. The process that was used to clone Dolly the sheep, and to clone dogs, and to clone things we've cloned, and to clone Celia and Cel in into Celia 2, 
the little Bacardi. That's not what they officially call Celia's clone, by the way. That's what I'm calling <laughs> Celia's clone because I'm a dork. <laughs> Those are processes that work as long as you have an intact cell, a living cell, which means that we are very limited because the technology that lets us preserve viable cells is only a few decades old, which means anything yeah. from before that we don't have an intact cell. And we might have it for a few species. This is, might be something we might be able to do, clone very recently extinct species. But for most things more older than that, it's not going to work. Could we, you might ask, get ancient DNA, like we talked about last episode, and build the whole genome again? The answer to that is maybe, but not right now. And maybe not ever. Yeah. Even the human genome is not 100% understood. There's a lot about DNA that we still don't know. There are parts of our own DNA that we still haven't fully figured out. We couldn't put together a 100% exact human cell with all the DNA in a lab synthetically. We're not there yet. There are still large stretches of DNA that, as far as we understand it so far, is just junk data. And we don't know why it's there, what it's doing, or what its use is. Yep. And we may discover that later. But so far, it's just nonsense. <laughs> and like we talked about last episode, we ancient DNA is always fragmentary and always broken. So not only do we not necessarily understand the whole thing, if we're missing pieces, you know, we use living species as a template, right? We reconstruct the mammoth genome by comparing it to modern day elephant genomes, which is great, except that if we're missing a piece that elephants don't have, we don't even know what we're missing. Yeah. So at the moment, we are incapable of reconstructing total ancient genomes to the point we would need to to clone them, presumably. And it might be impossible. So at least for the foreseeable future, cloning is pr not going to be a viable option for bringing species back from the dead. And if you're going to do it the Cecilia route, you also have to have some member living that is close enough to act as a surrogate mother. And there are animals we have lost that we don't really have good stand-ins yes. to do stuff like that with you so, know, the ever famous thylacine yes now let, let's move ahead because that will come <laughs> up to the second the second approach to de-extinction and this is the popular one this is the one that you hear talked about yeah you know, cloning is sort of the obvious draw well, jurassic park did it there's cloning this is the the approach which i'm calling genetic editing which is a terrible name for it but you'll see in a second this is the approach that's getting most of the press this approach involves combining DNA from extinct species with DNA from living species to create something close enough. Yeah. And I will begin the discussion of this using the story of the poster child for de-extinction. The iconic quintessential, this is the animal on the cover of the de-extinction cereal box, the passenger pigeon. A few hundred years ago, up until the 1800s, Passenger pigeon was one of the most abundant birds in the world. Passenger pigeons traveled North America in flocks numbering in the billions. I found an article on Audubon.com written by Barry Yeoman, which included stories from uh, accounts from people who saw passenger pigeons back in the day. Because human, most of our recorded history, we had passenger pigeons to live alongside. Yeah. This is a paragraph. I'm just going to read this whole paragraph about an account from a person who saw passenger pigeon fox. Ahem. <clears throat> in forest and city alike, an arriving flock was a spectacle, a feathered tempest, in the words of conservationist Aldo Leopold. One 1855 account from Columbus, Ohio, described a growing cloud that blotted out the sun as it advanced toward the city. Quote, Children screamed and ran for home, it said, Women gathered their long skirts and hurried for the shelter of stores. Horses bolted. A few people mumbled frightened words about the approach of the millennium, and several dropped on their knees and prayed. When the flock had passed two hours later, the town looked ghostly in the now bright sunlight that illuminated a world plated with pigeon ejecta. <laughs> there are accounts from people back then who said that a flock was so dense that you could fire a single shotgun blast into it 
and nab 50 to 100 birds. Woo! I'll give you one guess why they're extinct. The last passenger pigeon was named Martha, and she died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Since then, research has revealed that while they were still alive, passenger pigeons were majorly important components of their ecosystems. Flocks of passenger pigeons were remarkably destructive, which you would think would be a terrible thing. But what they would do is when they descended upon a patch of forest, their destruction would clear out old growth and make room for new growth. A passenger pigeon flock acted upon a forest the way that a forest fire does. Yeah. <laughs> Clearing out the old stuff, allowing for the growth of new stuff, and encouraging cycling of the forest environment. So as passenger pigeon flocks flew around North American forests, you would end up with this patchwork of old forest and new forest and in-between forest, which is great for supporting all different kinds of plants and animals that require different stages of the forest to feed and to mate and to have babies and such. With the passenger pigeons gone, this isn't happening. Forests are arguably more stagnant. Forests aren't rejuvenating the same way. The passenger pigeon was a keystone species. It controlled its ecosystem the same way those big grazers from the mammoth steppes of the Pleistocene did. So, Revive and Restore is heavily involved in a project called the Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback. The passenger pigeon, when it went extinct, left behind two very useful things. One, lots of museum specimens with plentiful ancient DNA for us to study their genome, and a close cousin, the band-tailed pigeon. The band-tailed pigeon does not act or live or behave the same way that a passenger pigeon did, but... To quote Ben Novak, who is the lead of this project, 97% of the passenger pigeon genome is alive within the band-tailed pigeon. So the idea here is to bring back the passenger pigeon, sort of, sequence the genomes of the passenger pigeon and the band-tailed pigeon, which has been done, examine what the differences are. Somewhere in that 3% of difference should be plenty of the material that gives you a bird that made passenger pigeons grow fast from, from birth, instinct to flock in huge numbers, to migrate across the forest the way that they did. If we can find those differences, edit some of them into a band-tailed pigeon, we will end up with a genome that is as close as we can get to a passenger pigeon. Technically a hybrid, technically an animal that is a band-tailed pigeon that has been given a bunch of traits from a passenger pigeon and will ideally act and behave like a passenger pigeon and, 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 and affect its environment the way that a passenger pigeon does. After that, it's the simple matter of finding surrogate parents and then raising them and teaching them to live in giant migratory flocks and then releasing them into the wild and having a sustainable population. At the moment, this is in the early, early stages. Yeah. Note, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later. Right now, what they're doing is early sequencing, early experiments with editing pigeon genome, which is one of the things that Ben is working on now. Their goal, that they say on their website, is to release the first test flocks into the wild within the next 15 to 20 years. Wow. It's important to note that this is not really a passenger pigeon. It is as close as we can get to a passenger pigeon using fancy genetic editing software, which we have now. If you follow the news, you've heard of CRISPR, Cas9, and all these exciting new genetic editing Absolutely. technologies. If the passenger pigeon is the poster child for the extinction of this sort, then the older brother who the passenger pigeon lives in their shadow is the woolly mammoth. Absolutely. Very similar projects have been suggested for the woolly mammoth. This is something being worked on by, among other people, George Church's lab at Harvard, very famously. Once again, mammoths, major keystone species in the northern grasslands, the same way that elephants are majorly important keystone species today in Africa and Asia. Woolly mammoths and Asian elephants are 99% genetically identical. Research has already identified genetic traits that code for things like Thicker hair, thicker fat, blood hemoglobin that is more efficient at colder temperatures in terms of holding oxygen. 
basically the stuff that lets a woolly mammoth survive in the north. George Church and other people have the idea to find those parts of the genome, edit them into an Asian elephant, and create an Asian elephant plus some mammoth traits mm -hmm. that could then survive in the northern stretches of our continental landmasses and hopefully do the things that mammoths used to do. So the, these, this is creating new animals yes. that resemble the old ones. And so it's, it's almost, it's a step forward to go a step backward. It's a, it's a weird, you know, it's a counterintuitive process, but it, it is getting you as close as you would probably get. Yes. And it's using, again, it's using the tools nature already has provided to create something that is as good a replacement as we, we can do for those missing parts of the ecosystems. Yes. Other candidates for similar projects include the heath hen, which is a prairie chicken, once very important to grasslands in the northeast U.S. Other birds like the great auk, the Carolina parakeet, the Labrador duck. Uh, the southern gastric brooding frog, the thylacine, <laughs> yes. as you mentioned before, Stellar's sea cow gets brought up. There's a whole list of animals that people are thinking that are fairly recently extinct that would be great to be able to bring back using some version of this method. And that was something I was going to point out is that due to the mechanics, you know, listeners may notice it is all recent things, mostly that we killed. Yes. And that brings me to some of the limits of this approach. For one thing, we need good ancient DNA, which means we're limited to recent species. Once again, last episode, we talked about where you can get ancient DNA. It also means certain environments are better. We get more DNA from things from northern cold latitudes than we do from the tropics. Yes. It also works best, as you mentioned before, for animals that we have good comparisons for. Like I said, we, we use templates. We know, very, we know a lot about mammoth genomes because we have elephants to compare them to. If you want to edit a genome, having something similar to it is super, super helpful, possibly essential. So mammoth is great, but would we be able to do this, to use an extreme example, with ground sloths? That was going to be my example, absolutely. There's nothing like a ground sloth today. No. Oh. Or what even weirder you... things like calicotheres. Like what? <laughs> That's that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, and and we get back into the the first discussion, the philosophical side of how would you know if they even are doing their job when you put them back in? Even if you, if you somehow were able to edit genetic engineer a ground sloth and then you released it, is it doing the job right? You don't know exactly. <laughs> and this is actually really interesting that that point. That point was made in Jurassic Park. Yes. The scene where they're arguing around the chili and sea bass at the table. Yep. There's some really interesting points made at that argument that have come up. We'll talk more about the, the, the criticisms and such in a little bit. Uh, for now, like I said, this process is in early stages. Genetic sequencing, editing, uh, technology is always improving and advancing, and it will need to if this is going to be a reality. But people are already thinking about the future. Here are some of the questions, just a few, that people have to think about because they will be challenges going forward in this approach. Who are your surrogate mothers for these <laughs> growing hybrid embryos? Will a kind of mammoth grow okay in the womb of an Asian elephant? Could a different species support an extinct hybrid species kind of thing? Will your hybrid embryo get what it needs? Can a, for example, elephants feed their children breast milk because they're mammals? Elephant babies also eat the feces of their parents to get very important nutrients and parasites, uh, and gut microbes and things like that. Will that work for these hybrid things? Also, will this new hybrid species do okay in captivity? Domestic birds are great candidates for this because yeah. heath hens you can raise like chickens and Passenger pigeons were already domesticated. We were already <laughs> working on things like that with passenger pigeons. Elephants, uh, as a counterexample, do not tend to do well in captivity. Uh, large animals are difficult to care for. Yes. And exotic animals, rare animals, are a nightmare. And these would be the rarest of animals. <laughs> these literally, because 
the whole point of zoos and aquariums is that you work together to figure out how to take care of an animal. If you only have one, you're the one that figures out what works and doesn't. And if something doesn't work, that may be the it for that animal. There was a talk I saw, as, as and I'll link this in the, the blog post, because there was a whole TED meeting about de-extinction. Lots of great talks. I will put the whole list in the blog post for this episode. Yeah. One of the, the, the talks discussed condor conservation and how that's exactly what they had to do. They had to figure out how to take care of condors, but all they had were the last condors in the world. Yeah, it's very daunting. And then and this so far we've talked about individual animals. Another question that's going to come up is how do you raise it? How do you teach it to do what it needs to do? Passenger pigeons lived in flocks of billions of birds. Elephants are extremely social animals. Yeah. This is goes back to I, I always like to think of it like humans if a human was raised by chimps. Yeah. If a human's raised by gorillas, it makes a good movie. Other questions involve whether or not they will be able to survive in modern day ecosystems. Not just because obviously the world has changed, right? Especially for a mammoth. That's a significant shift in the environment. But also, is there room for them? Where do we put these flocks of millions of passenger pigeons? Where do we put a herd of mammoths, quote mammoths, quote passenger pigeons? Where do they go? All of these are questions that are actually being considered now. And if you look at the Revive and Restore site, I'll put that in the blog post as well. You can see their step-by-step -step plans. You know, how are we going to raise the pigeons? How are we going to, where are we going to put them? What size flocks are we going to want to use? They've actually thought these things out. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there is some thought gone into it. But as you can see, there are lots and lots and lots of obstacles. This isn't something happening next year. And all those obstacles would apply to every single animal that you could potentially do this with and they're going to be and different they, <laughs> with yeah, everyone they, yeah. the answers for each one could be you know what works for a pigeon might not work for a mammoth you know who'd thunk yeah yeah imagine that <laughs> so cloning is a potential option for certain species this sort of hybridization engineering is another option being considered for lots and lots of different animals it's it's kind of the pipe dream at the moment it is the most sci-fi of them. Yes, it's the most popular, yes, it but it's is. definitely the most science fiction. There are people who think that it is absolutely not going to work. There are people who think it's there are people who think that it's ridiculous to try. More on that later. Like we said, this is very controversial. But first, the third option for de-extincting, or at least the third general option that we're going to talk about here, which is I I think the least sort of exciting in the, in the in the sense that cloning is exciting and and genetic the, engineering the is exciting least out there and extreme but actually my favorite well it's the least hollywood worthy it's also by far the most realistic yes it is this is backbreeding and backbreeding i will demonstrate with the story of the aurochs Aurochs were wild cattle. These were sort of these big, beefy, brawny cattle with big old horns that used to be very widespread across European ecosystems. They were major grazers in northern grasslands. And they were keystone species, just like all these other animals we're talking about. They were important components. Big grazers are very, very important components of their ecosystems and have been for a long, long time. The aurochs, of course as with all these other animals, was driven to extinction by humans Gasp. fairly recently. But their DNA is still with us in their descendants, domesticated cattle. The logic of backbreeding is that all the DNA you should need to create something very much like an aurochs should be in cattle today. Spread throughout the domestic breeds of cattle, we should have the features that you could put together you could cobble and assemble those features together to create a breed that is effectively the same as an aurochs. One of the very convenient things about aurochs is because we domesticated them, we have tons of information about them. Physical descriptions, behavioral accounts, 
We know a lot about their genetic attributes. There are cave paintings of the, like we have great, <laughs> great historical records of aurochs. We have a full profile on them. We do, which means we, it shouldn't be too hard to identify what makes an aurochs an aurochs and aim for those traits. And then we're, recreating them we're not reverse evolution right but we are creating something approximate using genetic engineering but not the crazy crisper you know scary kind that we have today but the old-fashioned kind that we've been doing for ten thousand years selective breeding maybe think of guardians too <laughs> i prefer to make people the old-fashioned way <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna make we're gonna make aurochs the old-fashioned way we're yeah. gonna have we're gonna introduce cows to cows and select for those traits. Select for the traits that allow them to live in the wild, that 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 allow them to be the grazers they once were. One of the big projects looking into this at the moment is called the Toros program, which is part of you find information about this on rewildingeurope.com, which is a bunch of different projects for reintroducing the wild species, similar to what we talked about in episode eight. There are other projects that are looking to doing this with other animals wild horses similar story domesticated horses were bred from wild horses so can we breed a species breed uh, or create a breed that looks and acts and behaves like wild horses and then put them back into the wild there's at least one project trying to get the quagga back from closely related plain zebras cool i even found a project in my digging, and I didn't get the chance to look too deeply into this, of a dire wolf project. Oh. Now this, from what I could tell, this seems to be mostly an aesthetic thing uh, of a, people who want to breed dogs to create a breed of dogs that looks like a dire wolf, but, but actually sticking to paleontological descriptions. Of, so the dire wolf, listeners, was a species of wolf that lived during the Pleistocene, I think a little bit bigger than the wolves we have today. It, if I remember right, their their heads are not much bigger, but their bodies were just beefier. Interesting. <clears throat> like when you look at a skull of a dire wolf, it's not as impressive as you expect, but their body was just beefier and more heavily built, and they show differences in like the teeth and their diet. Right, right. So they weren't they, they weren't they, you know they they had some stark differences. They were yeah <laughs> yes yes. They they were not horse sized, but I think that this I think that this is most mostly we want to create a breed that's this because it's cool, not necessarily mm. for environmental purposes. Although if they're doing it already, <laughs> like we said in episode eight, you can't only bring back herbivores, <laughs> which is another really interesting consideration. That eventually, if you're introducing herds of aurochs and mammoths and quaggas back into the grasslands. You need somebody to eat them. A short face bear. Short face bear. You bring a short face bear. That would be certain. Oh, that would that'd be so cool. <laughs> I mean, so environmentally helpful. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a few different approaches to this particular problem. This question of can we bring back an approximation of an extinct species? Can we bring back something that is useful in the same way that extinct species were? Can we in engineer the e ecosystems? using the tools of the past and the present that that we have available to us make hybrids or new breeds or clones or whatever this is de-extinction this is the science of de-extinction in, in, in all its many facets in all its many facets however not everybody likes this idea <laughs> so let us let us ask the question now if our scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could <laughs> that they didn't stop to think if they should. It's yeah, it's it's, it's there's a lot to unpack when it comes to de-extinction. It's it's a very complex issue. Yes. So if while we were talking about this, you were listening and thinking to yourself things like that definitely wouldn't work or doesn't this seem like a bad idea or aren't we playing god or haven't you seen Jurassic Park? Yeah, these are comments that have been made. In fact, like I said, there's lots of controversy around this idea. There are a lot of people who are very cautious about it. There are a lot of people who are ardently opposed to it, who think that this is bad. Yes. I have a, I have a list of common arguments that have come up against the idea of de-extinction. Do you have any? Did you want to do any come to mind for you? Do you have any favorites? 
I think the the most you know as you were saying the the common issues that come to mind hail from previous experiences. It is it's a cool idea to think about trying to reintroduce an animal that we wiped out, so there is precedent for us to undo our damage. Mm-hmm. And it is ideal to try to bring back that animal. But then on the flip side, if you look at human history for trying to introduce animals to habitats to help the habitat, see cane toad and kudzu and et cetera and, and et cetera and et cetera. Yeah, this is one of the big arguments mm-hmm. against it. Are we just creating new invasive species? At most of the times when we assume we know how to fix the habitat. Now, given a lot of these introductions were done for monetary gain, so mm-hmm. it was a different motivation in most cases, but... Yeah. The same concerns are there. There's a lot that goes into an ecosystem, and we are not privy to all of it most times. Yes. So that one of the big arguments is, will this help the environment instead of damaging it further? Is there even environment to put them in? Mm-hmm. That's another big thing that, that, that people like to bring up is, you want to, where are you going to put a mammoth? Like, yeah. it's silly to pretend that we have, they, they would argue, that we have the room to do this, that there are, if there's even environmental space to <laughs> support these animals. That there's just not just mammoth-shaped holes in the ecosystem. Yes, right? <laughs> it, it, they, well, though there were, but they have grown over, mm-hmm. right? There's something in the way. Some people argue that these are valid arguments that you could still do the extinction, but just focus on things that have very recently disappeared. Mm-hmm. There have been successful programs putting animals back into ecosystems. This has been done with island tortoises. It was done with wolves. Uh, one of the biggest arguments that comes up, and this this is one of the most common ones that I see, is the argument that this, the idea of bringing back extinct species or extinct phenotypes or whatever, however you want to phrase it, is a huge expenditure of time and money and effort that could, and they would argue should, be going towards saving the species we have today. Yeah. That why why would we put all this money and effort into trying this crazy experiment a, a major gamble yep when we're losing species left and right here now where conservationists are struggling mightily to keep animals and plants around today yes so that they don't go extinct yeah the concern being the money and time you spend on bringing back one species might have been able to save two from disappearing Right, or even more, maybe 30, mm-hmm. because who knows yes. how much this is going to go. Which is another one of the big sort of categories of arguments is the notion that we simply don't know enough to make this work. We don't or know enough about... Efficient. Yep. We don't know enough about the, the genome to build a working no. new one. We don't know about the development of these animals. We don't know what they needed. To think, I mentioned it before as sort of a curiosity question of could a mammoth hybrid even be born properly in the womb of an Asian elephant? Would it be raised properly? Mm, Yeah, would you even get past step two? Yes. And and for some people, those are interesting. Oh, well, we will find, we will solve those issues at some point. But for other people, those are sort of make or break questions. Like if we don't know the answer to that, what are we bringing this thing into the world for? If it and that this gets into that, if just because we might be able to, should we? I mean, if yes. if it's just to see if we can, that's that might not be a good enough reason to yes. do it. It's also been pointed out by some people that even if you can get nutrients from mom or whatever you need, will a mammoth? Woolly mammoths mostly have been extinct for ten thousand years. Are the bacteria and the parasites that yeah. they needed to survive even here anymore? Is the food they need even here anymore? The correct internal biology, you know, the internal uh, bioculture. Yes. May be gone. So there's that's a big question. A lot of people will point out that once you get past, okay, can one of them survive? Do we know enough? Like, There's a big step from birthing one weird hybrid de-extincted animal mm-hmm. to raising a functional population of a, a trying to approximate a species that does is around anymore. Well, especially we take the Cecilia example where that was a one in 57 odds that one survived 
and it didn't even survive long. Yeah, in best case scenario. Now, you could argue, well, but we might get better as we go. You could, but you might not. It might just be like, you know, albinism, like albinos, where it's just, it's not a high odds rate of success. You know, yeah. are you going to go through thousands of goats, thousands of elephants to get yeah. the few that work? You know, that this is now not only a lot of waste, but it's dangerous for the surrogates. Yes, it is. and in, especially with something like elephants, elephant pregnancy is two years. It's not, yeah, not a quick turnaround. So to find out if it works, like it's two years just to see if it's born. And it could fail a year and a half into it. Uh, Celia died 10 minutes after birth, but yeah, was born, Celia too, but was born. And so, and even if we had a bunch of them, could we make a functional population? Mm -hmm. Are we going to be able to create a population that can survive in the wild? Or are we just creating human dependent species? Yes. Which is another huge question. Are we just making more work for ourselves? Yeah. The, the, the dream is here. We, we created a billion passenger pigeons and now they fly naturally around North America. Go be free. Go be free. Fly my pretties. And they do their thing. But if we can't do that, then what we have done is created a billion birds that we now need to take care of. Or that just fly off and immediately get gobbled up. It's, that happened with uh with red wolves uh which is a, is a, a subspecies um of wolf very rare i've heard arguments that some people think it's just a hybridization between coyotes and wolves like yep it is it, there there's controversy even just about the conservation for this animal as if it is it whether it is an animal that actually needs to be brought back but a breeding program bred a few and then released them on if i remember right it was islands around georgia and when okay. they went back to check on them, they had all been eaten by alligators. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that does sound familiar. Yep. And so they all that work in it, they were just feeding the wildlife. <laughs> Which goes to that question of, will they survive in the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. And not only will they survive in the natural ecosystem, but one of the big, big questions, especially for recently extinct animals, are their threats gone? Yeah. If but... an animal went extinct because of habitat loss... Is it still losing its habitat? Yeah. If a species was wiped out by poaching and you put it back in the wild, what do you think is going to happen? It's back on the menu. Back on the menu, boys. Yep. It, it, that's a huge concern, right? And it goes back to that qu that question of shouldn't we be focusing on today's problems uh, it, before we start bringing back problems from the past? It, it does potentially hearken to that, that famous Einstein quote, uh, which... This quote, this is a quote from Einstein, very fun one. It is not the actual definition of insanity, people. Uh, is that <laughs> trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results, you know, being a nope. futile endeavor. It, if yeah. you're just, hey, are we just going to bring things back for them to be killed off again? Yeah. Okay. Well, this time, stay away from the poachers, silly. Yes. <laughs> that's, not, that's not necessarily going to work. The big question that often comes up in my head when I think about de-extinction, and this, this is a very large discussion issue, but it's always kind of in the periphery is, and this is something that comes up with general conservation. And if you talk to anyone who works in the animal field and had, and, you know, works in a conservation organization or has that mindset, you will, if you get them on the subject of cheetahs or pandas, you'll often get people who will kind of go, Oh, cheetahs and pandas, because there's a, an argument to be made with some animals that we're trying to protect that these animals may have been on their way to extinction anyway. So trying to conserve them is actually wasted. You know, we're assuming that every animal that is threatened needs to be protected because we're so used to them being threatened because of us, but animals mm -hmm. go extinct all the time. Right. De-extinction is kind of the next step of that, of bringing back an extinct animal is almost a stagnant view of the ecosystem. Like, if you bring yes. back something that was, yeah, but ecosystems change. Yes, it's rough right now, but that happens all the time. Things disappear, the ecosystem diversity drops, and then it stabilizes, and then it comes back. That happens naturally before humans ever were around to muck it up. Yes. So the question has to be asked, yes, we got rid of it, but is bringing it back really, is that really a forward-thinking activity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and who 
who's deciding what we bring back? Yes. What do we know? What do we know about which of them were essential and which of them were important and which of them were missing? Which of them we don't know anything about? Ellie Sattler says in that scene in Jurassic Park, the, how can you expect to know anything about an extinct ecosystem? Yes. You know, are we, is it just a popularity contest? We, of course we all want to see a woolly mammoth, but is that really what's going to help? And that brings me to another argument that has come up. And, and I think that this is, is, is very, very, in, this is the one that you don't want to a- ask because it's the <laughs> kind of question that sounds very accusatory. But why are we doing this? Yeah. What's the real motivation? Yes. Who are we doing this for? Yeah. Do we want to bring back the passenger pigeon because it's really what's best for the environment? Or do we want to bring back the passenger pigeon because we feel guilty? Yes. One article that I read asks, are we too, is is it revealing that we keep wanting to call it a passenger pigeon mm-hmm. or a mammoth or an aurochs, despite knowing full well that it's not? Yeah. If we called them pseudo mammoths, would we be as interested in doing it? Yeah. Well, it, it, that, that question of what, what's the psychology of it? Yes. Are we doing it because it's satisfying? Are we doing it because it sounds like a cool idea? Even scientists are emotional creatures. And so are the people who support and fund science yeah. projects. And the public who chooses what science projects they're interested in and, and, and want to lend their, their support and voices well, to. Because what sounds cooler than bringing back the mammoth? Yes. Are we? T- There's not much that beats that. Are we caught up in fantasy? Yes. Once again, I think that point is so interesting. That said, if we stopped calling it a mammoth because it's not, mm-hmm. would that take away some of the shine? And if it does, maybe we're making a, maybe this isn't what we should be doing. If we start calling it a woolly elephant, yes, <laughs> would that would that diminish the appeal? One other argument that comes up, and this particularly with elephants, and this is I think a really interesting one because it's another sort of philosophical, uh, and this is the ethical issue. Yeah, uh, we, I, I mentioned earlier this 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 fantasy idea of a human being, you know, cloned on an alien planet. Would that be a, a representation of a human? And that's a whole psychological thriller to uh, be that, written about it. A so, human brought into a world with no humans. Well, why would we think that an elephant brought into a world where it's the only member of its species? If, if you want a good example, read The Time Machine. Yes, <laughs> like a, a single human or Planet of the Apes, you know, but a, a single human brought into a world where there are no longer humans they can at least relate to. Yes, and that, you know, you want to bring animals into the world without any parents, mm-hmm. without any peers who don't have a herd. This this was actually mentioned in uh, the second Jurassic Park book. Yeah. That, that the Velociraptors didn't know how to act like Velociraptors because there was no one to teach them. Yeah. But to think of, yeah, these are social animals. There's ethical arguments about keeping animals like this in zoos now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an issue that we have to talk about. And then there's the biggest the biggest argument uh, remaining on my list. Uh, and this is another one that, that I think is one of the biggest arguments that I see come up around this. And this is another one of those psychological arguments. This is another one. <laughs> this brings the focus back on us. If we can bring species back from extinction, does that remove some of the fear (laughs) of extinction in the first place? If the general human population gets it in their head that extinction is no longer permanent, can we be expected to continue trying so hard to avoid it? If you have a respawn option... Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Does exactly. that get rid of your concern and fear as to what risks you take? Is this a an excuse? Are we mm-hmm. do we risk giving ourselves an excuse to care less about our effect on the environment because we think we can just fix it? And this this may sound like a you know, if not ridiculous, unlikely scenario that I don't you know some people may feel I don't see why succeeding at bringing an animal back would make us care less about the animals we have. Mm-hmm. But I've had conversations with people whose effective stance on conservation of the planet is that we just need to go find a new one because space travel has gone far enough that they're like, no, once we get to Mars, I don't care about Earth anymore. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, if you are hearing that argument and you go, well, of course we would still care about conservation, then you are one of the good people. Yes, then thank you. But I don't know how common that, yeah, I, I, that's not necessarily a common thought. And it's an issue that now we may not, but three generations down the line after it's been a thing, a perception can completely change. You know, yes. once something becomes commonplace, the view on things around it can completely, you know, what was odd to our grandparents is now old to us. Yes. <laughs> and so what is a miracle to us of de-extinction could just be a thing that is in the the science books. Yeah. And is not a big deal anymore. I mean, so it is something to be aware of that we don't want to treat it like a get out of jail free card. Yes. These are but a few of the arguments levied against this idea. We've talked in this episode about what the idea is, what are the various ways people are looking into doing it, how far there is to go. <laughs> And what some of the really major considerations we need to to take into account are as we as we keep exploring this. As usual, we have breezed over this. There's so much to this, and most of it it, it is yet unwritten. Yeah. But I would love to. Uh, they they call this a call to action. I would love <laughs> to present a call to action to you, dear listeners. What do you think? Please let us know. This is one of the. This is one of the the most sort of opinion welcoming mm -hmm. subjects we've discussed on the on the podcast did we not mention a criticism that you that that comes to your mind did we not mention a benefit that comes to your mind what do you think should we do it should we bring stuff back yeah. uh, should we not do it or we uh, is jeff goldblum gonna come yell at us <laughs> for for even thinking about it and and feel free to share i i, I feel like it we may have sounded overwhelmingly negative on the idea during the last little section of the the episode and there there's a lot it's more it's not so much that we are aggressively against we you know our our stances on it may fall on one side but those are all issues for such a new and radical concept there's always going to be a lot of potential issues i mean it's the same thing if someone yeah. if if you wanted to suddenly create cold fusion there's going to be people that go <laughs> okay but first, let's ask these questions. <laughs> yes. Well, it's interesting because I I was uh, keeping in my mind in the beginning of the episode that we probably sounded overly optimistic. Yes, that's very, that's that's probably so true. Trying to hit trying to hit both. That's probably both true. Sides here. It's it's a complicated issue, uh, and there's probably a lot more conversation to be had before we start seeing any major results in the real world. Yes, I look forward to episode, you know, 135 where the extinction <laughs> part 2 where we talk about, you know, where we where we meet the first passenger. Yes, planes. where we we have to discuss the successes and <laughs> or and or failures. <laughs> yes. In the meantime, dear listeners, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our requesters for requesting this subject. This excellent, is, excellent subject. This was a fun one. As always, there will be a blog post. I will put Links to the places we've talked about in the blog post. I'll put uh, that, like I said, the list of the Ted D extinction talks because mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. a whole long list of them. I haven't even watched all of them. There's a lot of really cool stuff from the people who who are doing this, as well as from some of the people who are highly skeptical. I'll put a couple of articles written by people who don't like the idea, so you can get some of the counterpoints as well. Uh, if you haven't read Beth Shapiro's book, How to Clone a Mammoth. I would highly recommend it because she lays out a lot of this, the same stuff we've just talked about. And she does a very good job of it. In the meantime, as always, please feel free to contact us. Uh, follow, see us on social media. Listen to the outro message for the social media list. We love taking new requests. We love taking feedback. We love hearing what you think. Every episode that ends in a number five is an extinction-related topic, so start telling us what you want us to do for episode 45, you which will come episodes. up eventually. Ten episodes to think about it. We release new episodes every fortnight. Not the game. So, the measure Not the time. game. Every, four, every, every two weeks. Every 14 days. Stay tuned. Return. Come back in two weeks for the next episode. 
Also, keep an eye out because, like I said, Saturdays in June, we're going to be talking about something a little special. Something not altogether unrelated to the subject of de-extinction, as it turns out. It's, it's, it's in fact, right up your alley. It is right up your alley. <laughs> oh, boy, all the quotes. The Common Descent Podcast, just like perhaps some of the creatures we've discussed in this episode, will return <laughs> in our next episode. Until then... Enjoy dreaming about animals of the past. See yeah, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.